Hey guys, we're here with uh, episode six of our series we're calling The Church, and uh, where we're, we're checking in with different folks um, uh, throughout uh, throughout the weeks and trying to figure out how we can not only survive this pandemic, but maybe potentially thrive. And uh, and so this week we're, we're taking a look with um, Rick Mann, and Rick Mann is uh, is specializing in leadership, and he heads the uh, the MBA program uh, at Treveca, and um, I think just wrote uh, maybe not the book, but a book on uh, on leadership, um, and uh, and so we wanted to get with him and figure out how we could um, lead during this time. Well, we know that many of us right now are are in pretty you know difficult positions where uh, where we're leading, uh, and we're having to potentially lay off uh, different employees, potentially calm fears and, uh, and maybe even hopefully rally the troops and, and keep customers uh, with us. And so uh, we, we wanted to check in if, and, and try to get some best practices on how we can continue to lead uh, during, during this time. Uh, so Rick, thanks for joining us and, uh, and let, us, uh, let us know how, how, can, how can we do this or, or how can we survive as leaders uh, during this time? Well, Grant, it's good to be with you today. And I'm going to use leadership fairly broad here. Grant, you have a couple of children that you lead. Uh, you have people at church and business and others. So, so we're going to use leadership today to talk really about all those people we have influence on. Sometimes it's leading our, our own families. Sometimes it's leading uh, extended family members, maybe a niece or a nephew or an aunt and uncle. Uh, often we think of leading at work, a team that we lead, or a department that we lead. So we're going to use that fairly broadly. And all the principles we talk about today, you can use these with your children, you can use these at work, you can use these at church. And so the first thing I want to mention is that in times of crisis, people are really looking to leaders to be calm. And so you may have a lot of anxiety or nerves yourself. But those you lead, hopefully you can give them a calm voice, a bit of reassurance, and not bleed all over those that you lead because they're looking to you as their leader for some stability, some safety, and some care. No, that's good. I think, um, you know, I think we've all seen leaders uh, that when, when crises hits, uh, we can tell they're very rattled. And I've been under... Uh, I remember when I when I first started uh, in banking, um, you know, during the Great Recession, uh, banks were going through some hard times, and so uh, some of the leadership uh, was visibly rattled, and that didn't sit well with us. And we started looking at other jobs, and how, you know, what are we going to do? And and then there were other leaderships that were were very calm, and it it kept me from searching the job boards and 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 trying to figure out how, what am I going to do? I, I I kept thinking like, okay, if they're calm, uh, I can be calm. So I think that's a great. That's a great point. Well, you want to be calm, but you also want to be authentic. You don't want to act like nothing's wrong when there's an elephant in the room. And so yesterday, we had a, a call like this from the president of Trevec University, Trevec Nazarene University, Dan Boone, just a great leader. And he did all these things, brought that calm voice, talked about how they wanted to continue to pay our salaries. And we did need to make some budget cuts, so he gave some suggestions on that. But just being this balance of, on the one hand, being calm, but on the other hand, being authentic to say, wow, if you're feeling a little nervous or anxious, that's understandable. And we want to walk you through this chapter together. We're not in this alone. We may be separated, but we're not alone. And I thought he really did a good job of that balance of being authentic and being calming as well. The next thing I want to mention, and I'll talk about a call I got recently from someone in Africa. And the next thing we want to do is to say, what are some things that we can learn during this time of crisis that we wouldn't learn otherwise? And this call is a good example of that. I think uh, so many people had not even heard of Zoom before. And last week, Sherry was on a telemedicine with her healthcare clinic. She's a nurse practitioner. And so her office had never used Zoom, a pretty small Christian clinic in Mount Juliet. Her office had never used Zoom, and Sherry had never used Zoom. So I provided just a little bit of tech support, but they really did fine. 
They had a good call with her patients. And this is learning some things, building some capacities they didn't otherwise have. And so when you're talking with your children or when you're talking with your team to say, hey, before we forget, what are some things that we can learn during this time we couldn't learn otherwise? And let me mention this. A couple of months ago, I got a call from this guy, coach in Africa. He's the country director for Medical Teams International, has a team of about 1,500 healthcare related folks in all of Uganda. In fact, we were supposed to go see him next month. We're not gonna do that trip, but uh, just a great leader. His name's Andrew. And he said, Rick, we've, uh, we've had some inspections by the UN. We didn't do as well as we would have liked. So we're really in disarray. I'm really stressed. And uh, can we talk a little bit about this? So we had three or four calls over three or four weeks to talk a little bit about this. And I said, Andrew, what are some things that your team can learn in a crisis that you could not have learned otherwise? And I remember on the second or third call, he said, Rick, this has really totally reoriented our team. We were freaked out, we were stressed out, we were trying to survive. And then we realized there's a lot of things that we can learn during this time of crisis that we could not learn otherwise. For his direct reports, they had not really led at the senior level. They had a lot of people reporting to them. So they talked about how they could learn to lead in crisis in ways that they had not learned before. So whether it's your five-year-old, your 15-year-old, or your 50-year-old teammate, say, hey, let's explore some things that we can learn that maybe we couldn't have learned otherwise. How can we build some capacities that we hadn't had otherwise, even if it's just using Zoom? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I've learned is uh, how many meetings can be phone calls and how many <laughs> meetings can be emails and, uh, and even these Zoom calls. I mean, it's, uh, you can get a lot done and, um, and still keep your gym shorts on. Is, is, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm learning here. Uh, most of my time, it seems like, before, before crisis was running around two different meetings and all of that time in between travel and stuff. So it's, it's pretty interesting. But there is a lot to learn. I just got off a staff meeting with our church and, you know, we're sort of understanding, okay, what are the vital things? What are the things that are most important? Um, and it, it's helping us kind of boil down um, into, into the really, the core, core components of, of what we're doing as a, as a church. And then on some other business things that I'm working about core components of those, uh, of those businesses. So it really is an interesting time to kind of learn and maybe reset priorities so to speak, for mission drift. You know, you get on the mission drift and then all of a sudden, bam, you know, you're, you're kind of called back on. Yeah, you really highlight it. You know, Grant, you say that well, is let's reaffirm our central vision and values and what is it we're really committed to is our core mission. And then is, as you look at that, let me just give you an example. We have uh, three sons who live in Chicago, Seattle, and Hong Kong. And together they have four children, four children, five children, that adds up to 13. Well, on the one hand, we are sometimes disappointed we don't live closer, but we do calls like this with them for years, for, uh, for months and months, and it really works pretty well. And so how can we reaffirm our core mission, vision, and values, and then uh, leverage some of the technology to visit it? I had a coworker say just the other day, he says, you know, before, you fly to a meeting, you hold a meeting, you fly back. You drive to a meeting, you hold a meeting, and you drive back. And how much more efficient the Zoom call, calls are um, than driving or flying to meetings. So, so when we go back to face-to-face, -to -face, maybe it's a hybrid, maybe it's a mix. Some of the meetings are face-to-face, -face, some of the meetings are on Zoom. It can be more efficient and it can be less costly as you, as you think about that. Um, let's also realize that sometimes in the midst of our lives, a crisis breaks in and something changes. And um, uh, not that many years ago, Sherry came to me and she says, my health's not that great. We're living in Minnesota. And so you need to switch jobs. Well, that was an instant crisis. Uh, I remember for the first hour thinking you've ruined my life. And, uh, but you know, we're about five, six years into our move in Nashville now. And um, we love living in Nashville and what we're doing at Trevecca so much more 
than what we were doing before in Minnesota. And at the time, a crisis created a need for change. But, you know, Grant, you just mentioned a few moments ago, maybe the Zoom calls better than the face-to-face -face meeting at times, but we wouldn't have known that without a crisis. But sometimes the crisis might mean you lose your job or you need to move or you need to sell your house. I don't know what's, I mean, I can imagine people watching this call. There's all kinds of crises out there of people who maybe lost a job, lost a home, or even lost a loved one, uh, the ultimate loss in this um, COVID virus crisis. I don't know what people out there's losses, but sometimes a loss in a crisis leads us to a new chapter. And occasionally that new chapter was better than the last chapter. And so we can ask ourselves, okay, God, what is it in the midst of this? And if we look at the scriptures, God came to Abraham and said, sell everything you have and move to a place I will tell you. And he says, okay, what am I supposed to tell Sarah? Okay, God, where are we going? What should I tell Sarah? I'll tell you later. Or there were times when God came to Mary and said, you're going to have a child. She says, but I'm not pregnant. He says, well, you are now. And just think of all the crises across scripture and the redemptive history that God did. And Sherry and I have had that several times when we came back from China and it was decided that because of her health, we couldn't go back to China. We had thought that we would do that for our whole lives, but we're not doing that now. And um, so what are some ways in which God can redirect us because of the crisis in front of us? I think those are good questions, and, and especially for those of us maybe um, that are younger, that haven't experienced, you know, navigating through a, a real big crisis like this. It's the first time, and, uh, and I think these, these things, remaining calm, uh, looking for God's redemptive plan, and then seeing, seeing the crisis and the change as an opportunity, I, I think those things are, are huge uh, for us to think through, uh, especially if this is the first time that you found yourself in a situation of really having to either lead yourself um, through this crisis, lead, lead a family member, um, or maybe even a, a business through that. Can you talk to us, Rick, uh, really quickly? Uh, I know a lot of folks that are going to be watching this um, will be leaders of, uh, of churches that, um, that'll be tuning in, other, other friends and, and um, all of that. Is there you know, you, you've, led, you've led churches before and, um, and you've been a consultant on a lot of that. Can you, can you talk, to, um, talk to us just really quickly? Like what should they be doing? How should they be thinking? And, um, and how, how would that look right now? You've probably fielded some calls uh, from ministry leaders already. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of this applies to all of this grant, but I think those in pastoral or ministry roles Boy, it's just all these principles times 10. I still remember some years ago, a, about a 30-year-old la lady, little, little kids in the house called me up and she said, um, hey, Rick, I don't know what to do. Uh, I said, I was a pastor of the church at the time. I said, um, why? Well, what happened? She said, well, my husband just shot himself and he's dead here on the kitchen floor. And I remember saying to myself, God, I, don't, I hate this job. And I didn't sign up for this. So of all the things I've said on this video, uh, let me mention one other thing. Is that, um, boy, every, every pastor, every minister leader needs a few good friends and certainly uh, a good counselor on speed dial. Because um, you don't want to freak out in front of your congregation on Sunday morning. You want to be authentic. You want to be calming. You want to be real, all those things. But sometimes you just want to ye yell you want to cry, you want to quit. And so call up your counselor, coach, good friend, somebody like that, call up Grant or me and uh, yell at them, cry at them, do whatever you want, swear at them if you want to, but have some places where you can just totally let your hair down and be your real self because sometimes you need to do that. And being in congregation, I still remember I had an associate pastor who stood in front of the congregation and talked about um, his addiction to pornography. And we hadn't talked about it. He hadn't thought it through very well. And um, I'll just call him Bill. I said, Bill, standing up on Sunday morning, 
is not the time to do that unless you're really well prepared. We've kind of talked this through. Go talk about it with somebody else that's safe before. Now, there might be a time when you need to share this with the congregation, but usually, usually Sunday morning is not this time to share scary stuff to a bunch of scared people. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's one thing I would say to everybody, but also to those in ministry, and that is find a safe place of people you can freak out with who are not your children, your spouse, or your congregation. And maybe the last thing, because we don't want to go too long today on these calls, is, is be patient with yourself and be patient with your, those around you. Um, I had somebody the other day who I could tell who's normally a good friend of mine, a coworker at Trevecca, and I could just tell he was, he was mad, mad, borderline mean. And uh, so he, um, he kind of yells at me on an email. Also, too, is don't yell at people on an email. It's, uh, email doesn't communicate all the emotions that a face-to-face does. Even a Zoom call is better than an email. So he kind of yelled at me on this email, and I went back and I said, hey, you know what? I apologize. I probably didn't do this real well. How could I have done this better? Well, I think he realized after a couple of interchanges that he didn't handle it very well. He said, you know, Rick, you're fine. I was, I was just having, he was just having a bad day. And so when you're having a bad day, don't yell to people on your team. Um, yell at somebody else as who's a safe place. And, but be patient with yourself and be patient with those on your team. The people that you're leading, they're pretty stressed out too. And so if you're stressed out, be patient with themselves, with them, be patient with yourself, find somebody else you can freak out with. So that's probably enough for one day. I don't want to fire hose everybody with, with 27 things, Grant, but um, I want to let you know how much I appreciate you as our pastor. You do these things well. Well, uh, just as a disclaimer, if, if I do, a large part of it is, and thanks to Rick, uh, who's been walking with us uh, since day one, and uh, and and I know I've used you as a sounding board uh, more times maybe than uh, than you've liked, but um, uh, Rick is available as a as a resource uh, to uh, to help um, if you are going through uh, times. I know you love to meet with uh, with young leaders uh, and and help coach them and and all of that, and I'm sure uh, there's a lot of young leaders right now that that need some coaching and, uh, and, and your expertise is pretty, pretty varied. And so I'll do a plug, even though he doesn't know it, and then will probably ask me to edit this out. And, uh, you just came out, uh, with, uh, with a book and now you're, you're working on an audio book, uh, of, uh, your leadership principle book. What is it called, Rick? Well, I'm trying to, you know, as a professor, I'm trying to do writing all the time. So you mentioned earlier a book I wrote called strategic leaders are made, not born came out with a second book just later this last year on building strategic organizations, doing one right, one right now on kind of finance principles for lay people. But right, right, you made a good point there, Grant, is if you're part of the National Vineyard and you want to call up and cry or yell, uh, Grant's pretty busy right now. Uh, feel free to give me a call or an email. And um, occasionally I'll talk to people from our church, you know, they've lost their job or they're looking for a new job. And um, if you're a part of our church, I'd like to, um, I'd love to talk with you. My coaching clients, I usually charge them. But if you're a part of the church, we can do that for free. And uh, we just want to bless people during these stressful times. So anyway, Grant, hey, good to be with you. Thanks for letting me be a little bit part of your series. All right. Thanks so much, Rick. And uh, we'll be back uh, here next time with more. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.